Hello everybody, I'm John Atak, as you all well know, and I am delighted yet again to welcome Karen de la Carrière. Hi Karen. Here's John. Hello again. Always. And we have developments in uh, sunny Los Angeles, in, in your part of the world. Do you want to explain to, to people around the world what, what's happening today in Los Angeles? Los Angeles is in a fever of a mayoral race. Who's going to be the next mayor? Mm -hmm. There are two contenders. Karen Bass has been a Congress representative for five terms. Wow. So she's an old politician of, and then there's this newcomer who has never been in politics, mm -hmm. a builder and developer billionaire called Rick Caruso. And Rick Caruso has done some remarkable, uh, just remarkable things with LA. Mm -hmm. Now, Karen Bass, with her five terms, Los Angeles has 60,000 homeless at any given time. Trash on the streets. It, 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 certain parts of LA are like a third world country. No. So Caruso wants to put in five, 500 sanitation workers, build 30,000, get 30,000 people off the, he's, 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 he's like an Elon Musk. He thinks outside the box, he's a firecracker. So these are the two opponents. Mm. And the Rick Caruso campaign, they're not full of apostates. They're not ex-Scientologists, but they created an ad. Which we will be showing you. Here it is. This day and this new church of Scientology is an exciting moment because I know your goal and your commitment is truly to make a difference. That is why the words are exciting of your founder, L. Ron Hubbard, in the creed of the Church of Scientology. The Church of Scientology, I know, has made a difference because your creed is a universal creed. I look forward to helping you bring about the difference for everyone in the city, this golden state of California, and from here, the nation, and from the nation, the world. Okay, so this ad has been running multiple times on multiple channels, ABC, NBC, CBS, Channel 9, Channel 5, blah, blah, blah. And Scientology, you can tell how this impacted them. The first thing they did was they ran to the judge on the eve of the Danny Masterson trial, which is about to stop. Tomorrow is jury selection. Mm. And, and they told the judge, please let us delay this trial. With, the, with this ad running, we'll never get a fair jury. Mm. Judge denied it. Yep. And they told the judge, another, another motion, can we leave the word Scientology out of the trial? Deny. <laughs> they've cried wolf so many times with this judge trying to delay 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 this was just the judge was very clever the judge said well what about all these gangs and what about all these people a potential serial killer a this that all of them have horrible media all the time trials are not delayed because the media says this that and the other about Anyway, uh, I thought you were, so Karen Bass was interviewed on various channels mm -hmm. and she completely, she said, if I knew what I knew now, I would never have gone. I knew they had something, but I didn't know the depth of their abuse. So Where she- Where has she been hiding all of these years? 
Oh, she lies. She's a professional. Do, do you know, she, she said all this stuff about them wasn't even out then. Mm. Right. It's, 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 it's 50 years ago when the British <laughs> government labelled them. I didn't know. In 1984, when Judge Breckenridge in Los Angeles said they were schizophrenic and paranoid like their founder, I didn't. Just unbelievable. Or the LA Times in 1990, you know, and on and on and on. Yeah. Oh, well, politicians, yeah. eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, John, I see the public relations of Scientology in an absolute death spiral. It's in a free fall. You can't take the toothpaste back in the tube. What is your overview? Because you've seen it for three decades, maybe four decades. What, when you saw that ad, and you know that that anti-Scientology ad exposing truth, every word said there was truth. Time Magazine, the first quote, they sued Time for, it went on for 12 years to the Supreme, they wanted every level mm. to the Supreme Court. Absolutely. So I actually, I did the uh, review for the Reader's Digest on the Time piece, and this was before they sued, and Reader's Digest came to me, and they didn't pay me, I don't know what's wrong with me, but they went through, and I pulled out all the points that they sued on. And Reader's Digest was ne was not sued on that, um, oh. but it proved you know Rich Behar was absolutely right in 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 what he said. It was just they could get him into court, and uh, you know that that was to be avoided. But that there's this is is yeah you're right. It is four decades now. It'll be thirty nine years. Um, oh crikey, what day is it? In eight days' time, it'll be yeah. thirty nine years since I resigned from the Church of Scientology. So um, what a long time. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen an incredible amount of media. Actually, one of the things I did along the way, Steve Kent, um, the University of Alberta asked me to write a chapter for a book he was publishing on UK media. And um, he said, we've got three weeks, John, will you do this for me? It's like, because oh, you're a mate, yeah, I'll do it for you. And so I took, I canceled everything for three weeks. I read a thousand, news articles in that time and wrote something that was 100 pages long, which I then had to strip down to 25 pages. And then I got the contract from the publisher, Prager, who I am going to name and shame. And uh, I said, look, I, I'm not going to sign away all my rights in this for $80, which was what they were <laughs> offering, academic publishers. Eh? The other two I've worked for have paid me nothing. Um, I'm not going to sign. Uh, what I want is a year after it's published, I'll be able to publish the 100 page complete version of this. And they said no. So I didn't give it to them. So oh. I still got, if anybody wants John Atek's detailed analysis of press on Scientology in the UK media, it's still there. That's got to be worth something, hasn't it? Probably yeah. five or $10 the lot. But well, I could have got $80 for it. So I shouldn't sell <laughs> myself short. But, um, so yes, I have seen quite a lot of media over the years, and this is this is a new thing. You know, something different has happened here that it's now in the middle of a political campaign. I don't remember that happening before. I could be wrong, but I don't remember it. Um, and now you have both candidates rubbishing Scientology and saying, you know, this 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 is a really dreadful thing, and. Um, how splendid. And it's in the heartland. It's in the major recruiting territory of Scientology, Los Angeles. Um, so, and I, you know, it will be interesting to see what happens. When's the election? Is it in November at the same time as midterm? Yes, I think it's November the 6th. I think, and so, of course, Scientology orchestrated a campaign, begging all their their parishioners, they call it, their public, their gold, foolish public to write letters now. So, so that'll be about 50 the letters campaign. they'll get from all the yeah. Scientologists who are still loyal in LA. We, we will let the Caruso campaign know this is all orchestrated to shred and toss the letters in the garbage. But uh, one of the posters on Tony Ortega's blog was quite clever. He said, well, since both candidates know what an evil criminal entity Scientology is. Maybe they can 
take down this L. Ron Hubbard way bullshit title of the street. And I thought you were brilliant when we discussed it. You said they should call it Al Capone way. <laughs> it's just so people know <laughs> what they're getting into. <laughs> I thought that was so clever. Let's call it Al Capone way where you will go in and you will be ripped off of your life savings. <laughs> it's so true. It, it's incredible that it persists and that they were able to um, persuade um, Karen Bass to, to make such a, an over-the-top statement in their favour. We've seen that before from time to time, but yeah. um, how little research she must have done. She's not capable of researching that, then what does she know about Los Angeles and how good is she going exactly. to be as a man? Exactly. So when they challenged her on different news channels, said, what, what's this? What, what were you doing with Santa? She said, it was just a ribbon cutting ceremony and other officials, it was just, I was just one of many officials, lies. There was one other official mm. in uniform, a disgraced sheriff, one other official one she did all these other and there mm. was one other and he's in prison or he's doing prison time for a little, little so these two crooks karen bass and the the sheriff who's been who's been disgraced were there but mm. you know what i like about it john and then we'll go on to our main subject Surely, yeah. i hope that foolish politicians who get lured in by Scientology to give credence going into the future. I think all politicians are going to see the volcanic explosion and rah-rah mm. of tangling with Scientology and endorsing it. Mm. There are consequences to endorsing Scientology. There is, there is an aftermath. Mm. You go there, you think you'll get some votes, you curry some favors, and boy, years later, whoa, it's used against you. You approve of criminality? Whoa. I hope this will be a real stern lesson mm. to future foolish people in uniform and in politics who think they can endorse and give credence to Scientology. Yes, absolutely. And I think we're, you know, and again, there may be somebody watching this who, who, who knows different, but there have been quite a lot of politicians involved in Scientology over the years. Um, we had a, an English MP, Willie Hamling, who um, became a Scientologist um, because his boss, Richard Crossman, wanted to investigate Scientology and he was his undersecretary and he went down St. Hill and he liked it and he got involved. There was a Dutch MP, there was a Danish MP, Member of Parliament. Um, and of course, Sonny Bono, who was yeah. uh, a Sonny and Cher, who skied into a tree, yeah. um, which is a very strange way to die. But yeah. uh, he was a senator, I believe, <laughs> along the way. And um, not very bright, but, but then people who ski into trees probably aren't very bright. You know, poor man. Um, but I don't think there are currently any politicians, even in third world countries, who claim to be Scientologists. You know, yeah. uh, even in Russia, there, there's nobody that wants to associate with it. So um, it, it's an, it, it's fascinating, and and to see such a high power exposure, that this will, you know, a lot of people are going to see this, and they're going to get the message is very quickly made people are going to see it and, and they are thankfully you know if we add that to the great work that south park did then um very few people are going to be attracted by the uh, the, the body routers as they call in america we call them body routers here yeah. but um the, the two nations divided by a common language as churchill said um it, it it's a very important moment i think and of course the danny masterson trial will also you know, be very important, and the the coming hearings on human trafficking, we we may finally see some change. the The question we have to ask is: Will any politicians now think about doing something about this? For example, going to the IRS and saying, "Why do you regard this criminal group as a religion?" You know, 
And yeah. maybe we ought to change that, you know, after 30 years almost uh, yeah. of that persisting. And uh, David Miscavige should give up his pension, you know. A living trust in the Netherlands Antilles, I've been told, but, uh, you know, we're not meant to know that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we Also, uh, one, one last comment. There used to be a fear. The media had a fear of lawsuits and stuff. Hmm. In, now, the fear is gone. They can oh. see this is the emperor with no clothes. It's all bluster and threat and hot air. Well, it, it, but it, the fear was based upon litigation. When I was trying to get yeah. uh, Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky published in the mid-1980s, I had um, I approached 50 publishers. 11 of them told me they'd like to publish it, but there was no profit in it. Um, Neville Spearman, who published The Mindbenders, Cyril Vosper's lovely yeah. little book, which sold 108,000 copies around the world. Um, but Sp Neville Spearman personally responded to my letter. And I can see this English gentleman, you know, in his 70s, in his Savile Row pinstripe suit, signing himself off, death to the evil cult, which is what he wrote to me. Um, they, they're not well liked. But the point was basically it will cost more in legal costs than we can possibly make in profit. This is not a matter of morality because we're in business, you know. And I do understand that people in business have to make money, which is why I've never been in business. Um, because it's not one of my capacities. But after Blue Sky was published in 1990 in the US, and we had to litigate to get it out, um, Russell Miller, The Barefaced Messiah, which of course was based upon a piece of Blue Sky, in the bibliography it calls the book Hubbard Through the Looking Glass, but it, a piece of Blue Sky, I've got his annotated copy of it. So mm -hmm. I have no doubt. And I worked with him for 18 months on it, and, and he did a remarkable job. They would, they basically, Henry Holt publishers backed off in the US in 88 with a suit because although they won, the judge warned them that under this bizarre ruling about unpublished material, copyright material, letters, journals, things like that, he could be sued once it had been published. With me, they managed to get um, prior restraint. Only two okay. books in the history of the United States since the Constitution have been stopped from publication. Uh, the first was Victor Marchetti's book about the CIA, and you can see why they might not want that going out there. The second and last was mine, and how on earth Scientology managed to persuade the judge. I mean, I hope the judge in the Masterson case has somebody guarding his pets, so mm -hmm. that uh, unlike Judge Ritchie, they won't end up drowned in the swimming pool. That's been a that's been a real commonplace over the years. Yeah. Murdering pets. Terrible. Scientology kills pets yeah. of their enemies. So, but after we just managed to scrape through, we 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 lost on 17 counts in the case. And I had the same lawyer, um, mm -hmm. Mel, Mel Wolf, who who'd actually been Marchetti's lawyer. I don't know how that happened. And he went to my publisher who said, look, we, we don't want to do this. We're done. We've lost the case. And I think he pleaded with them. And we went back to appeal and we overturned everything that had gone against us, all 17 things, oh. because the judge hadn't understood copyright law or mm. had been paid a bribe or, or threatened or something. Mm. But that was the last book published in the English language mm. until Janet Reitman, 21 years later. That was, you know, in fact, one of, I can't remember which, it was maybe the Wall Street Journal said, shudder into silence. Yes. And so after Blue Sky, th th there was nothing. And then because of Rich Behar, because time stood behind him and said, no, we're not, do we're not going to take this. Um, when they won the suit, Miscavige seems to have decided that the bad publicity wasn't worth it. And so rather than using the war chest of the International Association of Scientologists, and they spent something like $20 million failing to, to beat time, they stopped suing. And I think that was a bad mistake. I think they'd have done better if they'd kept throwing money, you know, get, had Kendrick Moxon fund all of these lawyers to, to chase down anybody that said anything they didn't like. Too late now. The cat is very much out of the bag. And... Uh, I have a cat and I think they shouldn't be put in bags. I'd just like to add that. 
So the cat <laughs> is now completely out of the back. Um, and the next year is going to be very interesting for Scientology. They have not sued any media since Time magazine. Yeah. Like Rinder has made a point of that. Hmm. They, they threatened, threatened and they, nothing they will write happen. letters as if yep. they're about to file suit. And this is all psychological warfare. This is just to get in their head. Yeah. They don't sue. Vanity Fair, when Scientology got wind of the impending article on them being used as a pimping dating service to find a sexual partner for Tom Cruise, mm -hmm. Scientology went in front and every day, every day, every day, there was a new threat letter to mm -hmm. Vanity Fair to not publish. Mm -hmm. And Vanity Fair got fed up and they, every day they published it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> they let the world see the huff and puff. So what happened, John? Vanity Fair published the essay, What Katie Does Not Know. And the essay went viral. And the rest so is history. In the past, Scientology did not sue. The letters are huffing and puffing. I think I'd like to call it puffing. It's yes, just puffing. Okay. It's puffery. Not, in a, huh? Puffery. 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 All hot air. Mm. Bogus. They used to send me a threat letter once a year or every six months. All huffing and puffing. Mm. Nonsense. Mm. Not worth... <laughs> I won't finish the sentence. No. So, um, yeah. So Scientology does not sue, but it... In fact, Hubbard has a doctrine saying, do not sue, do not get into litigation. Threaten to sue, that'll normally back them off. This is an actual OSA network or guardian office advice. Don't sue, but threaten. So OSA, apply that. Okay, good, John. So... Yeah, I mean, on, on that point, uh, as is ever true with Ron Hubbard, almost anything he said, he also said the opposite. So in 19, yes. 1955, yes. in the Scientologist, a manual on the dissemination of material, which is in the technical volumes to this day, I believe, it's certainly in my old set, um, something I never saw when I was a member, because, I mean, this guy just poured out all of this stuff. There was no way you could keep up with it. And I, I remember... The incredible sense of shock that's in the HCO manual of justice when I first saw that uh, which by the way has no copyright on it if anybody wants to publish uh -huh. that, well, that was the 18th point in my case that, that uh -huh. they couldn't sue me for quoting from that because they'd failed to renew the copyright so that is a public document and has some of the worst Hubbard material in it but so uh, yes um, in the Manual on Dissemination in 1955, he says you should sue, but the purpose of the suit is to stop the person. It, it's to, the purpose is to harass, that's the word he uses. He then, of course, says, if possible, ruin them utterly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought religion was meant to be about making the world a better and friendlier place, but Elrin Hubbard had a different view of that to me. Hubbard was vengeful and absolutely wanted to settle the score, settle the score. Yeah. Get in, get, get in. And Osa, what religion has a whole entity, a whole division, just to destroy their enemies? Think about that. A religion that has a whole division of staff who work 70, 80 hours a week, doing nothing but making smear hate pages full of a tissue of lies yeah. and all other actions done through clandestine private investigators to destroy the enemy. And, <laughs> and lest there be any doubt, if, if somebody wants to spend a few dollars and get a copy of this, it's got most of the dirty documents in, including this handwritten Elrond Hubbard piece, um, which says nice. that, um, let, let me, uh, I'm going to put my spectacles on because it's well worth it. He says, um, if anyone does anything to get any of these Scientology organizations in bad publicity, such as uh, narcotics charges, drunk driving or other unsavory data, I have a policy. 
I will beat their teeth in personally. Signed, so sincerely, and it has his monogram, LRH, on it. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, run out and buy a copy of that. I need the money. No. <laughs> it's got some really, you know, I, I put together what I thought were the most important facts so that if you've been involved in Scientology and you, you have a friend who's going, how are you so crazy as to get involved with that? You can give them this because it's not written in Scientology. It's, you know, it's mm. written in English, which mm. is the language I use. So uh, there's the plug for the day. <laughs> yeah, so Scientology's bogus hot air is just threat. And hmm. how religious is that? But you know, the very important point that the audience, the global audience, especially the United States audience needs to know is that their tax dollars are funding this hideous organization. Yep. Because for tax-free dollars, they're hiring lawyers and private investigators to harm US citizens. So by being off the hook and paying no taxes, they can use every extracted dollar from their public to harm and create vengeance. And you, you, all Americans watching this, you, the taxpayer, are funding this hideous, evil, evil organization, impersonating itself as a church. See, John, I want your feedback. We have two big advantages, just two. One is a lot of money. They got $3 billion in cash. But the other is hiding under freedom of religion the first amendment tell me how much they use for blood the first amendment we're religious <laughs> can you yeah. respond to that yes i i, I mean I, I, a friend of mine I, I was in los angeles in i think it was 1991 30 years ago with a dear friend and um he'd been involved since 1950 he was actually on the second dynetics course in elizabeth new jersey and uh, Hubbard had already left the building. He only taught the first week and was gone and just spending the money. And so he'd been involved for, he was involved for 32 years. He was a rocket scientist, for real, he was a rocket scientist. He worked in the same place that Jack Parsons had worked on solid fuel, Hubbard's uh, magical friend. Uh, and then he'd become a psychologist. He, he did IQ testing. So you know, he was a fairly educated sort of man. And he said to me, um, it really annoys me because whenever I mention Scientology to, to my family, they say, yes, but it's a religion. And mm -hmm. I said, well, Michael Aquino's Temple of Seti is, <laughs> is registered as a religion uh, and they're Satanists. So, and he, he was furious. He, he had a bit of a bad temper and, and I, a, a, a raw spot had been touched. And he shouted at me for, I think it really was about 20 minutes. And we sat in a diner in L.A. And I'm sat there beginning to quiver because, and the diner, which was empty when we went in, fills up for lunch while we're there. And all these people are looking at my friend shouting at me. Um, it, it was really quite something. But, but that point holds that what is it? Why is it that people think that something being a religion means it's a good thing? Let me give you an example. It's very simple. Um, the Aztecs used to rip people's hearts out still beating, to give to Huitzli Pushli, something like that, so that because otherwise the sun wouldn't come up. Now that's a religion. The thuggies in India uh, used to strangle people on the roads. They, they were killing four or 5,000 people a year in celebration of the religion of Kali. So the idea of something being a religion necessarily being good, and I'm afraid that some of the Christian religions have had a little bit of a problem with witches and burning people at the stake. It, it doesn't mean a good thing that something's a religion. In fact, it quite often means a bunch of fanatics who are going to do harm. So you know, it is not to criticize those people who actually do support compassionate and decent religions that help people. That's great. But the word religion is not a blanket term for goodness. No, but the First Amendment, the First Amendment. In the you should have freedom of belief, of course, but not freedom of action, you know, saying, um, 
as you say, and if you start looking at the amounts of money that are involved, when the IRS forgave the yeah. debt, um, they proved in court in excellent rulings, they had proved that money was inuring to Ron Hubbard's private bank accounts. Ron Hubbard, I believe, left $648 million. All of that money came from Scientology. He had no other sources of income. He wasn't a best-selling novelist. You know, they'd had to pimp the novels to get yeah. them out there. You know, Battlefield Earth, they bought uh, 40,000 advanced copies and they yeah. paid a quarter, gave a quarter of a million to the publisher, to yeah. um, St. Martin's Press, to publish yeah. it, publicize it. So they bought their way in. All that money came from Scientology. That means that tax should have been paid on it. And in the yes. end, I believe they settled the IRS for 12 million. Now, when you look at percentages, that's not very much out of the 648. So somebody got very frightened. Somebody decided that, that they, they could, you know, Scientology was going to hurt them badly if they didn't grant them this favour. And I would, we would very much like to know what really happened, you know, what threats were made that, that made that happen. You know, I'm not a big fan of the IRS, I must say. <laughs> But uh, there's organized crime and then there's the IRS, but um, they don't have a great reputation ethically. And this I do know that the IRS hate Scientology. The mood I internally is absolutely dis despising. I was, consulted only, I was consulted only once by the IRS. It was in Reno, Nevada. And again, I think that would have been in the 1991 trip. And um, this IRS agent sat down with me and he was very, very cagey. And it's like, I've published a book about them. Come on, <laughs> I'm not on their side. And eventually he started talking to me and he said, Scientology is the first case to have had 1,000 IRS agents work on it. Mm. And they still backed off. You know, after all that. And they, they had wonderful rulings that were absolutely rock solid showing that money had been going into Hubbard's back pocket. Mm -hmm. So the consequence of that is that the, let's say, $150 million that he should have paid in tax on that 648 didn't go into the exchequer. And that because they don't pay taxes on their buildings, they don't pay for the services around them. And if you're a Scientologist, you can pay money to them and, and claim tax back on it. It is exactly as you say. Scientology has cost the American public billions of dollars. And it's time that stopped. It, it, it's time, you know, write to your congressman and, and say, have you seen this ad? <laughs> you know? yeah. they, they it's anti-social. by the it US government to harm other Americans. Hmm. That's what they do. This whole division also. You know, it's all puff and huff that it's legal and PR. Basically, OSA are there to destroy the enemy. The Office of Special and, Affairs. Yeah. Define special. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the indoctrination of Scientology is so deep that Scientology, you learn from day one, is there's the survival of Scientology trumps and is absolutely outdoes anything else. The whole That's agonized why. future of every man, woman, and child on this planet depends on what we do here and now absolutely. in Scientology. Now, absolutely. what I want to know is why he thought the future was going to be agonized. You'd have thought that Scientology would be making it nice, but the whole <laughs> agonized future depends. So he, he was being honest there. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it's a, a world without war, without crime, without insanity. And, you know, insanity and crime are fundamental to Scientology. It causes yeah. insanity by yeah. committing crimes. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. well, fanaticism. It's not good for people, generally. Well, I was in 40 years, John, and uh, it took a long time to wake up. Hmm. So much in the bubble, so much influence with Scientology thought. Um, it's, you know. It is amazing. No more gurus for me, no more gurus, no more. <laughs>
No, I mean, when Van Morrison finally left, he, he I can't remember the album's called like No Teacher, No Guru, No Something or Other. And he dedicated Inarticulate Speech of the Heart to L. Ron Hubbard, you know. So uh, oh. Van Morrison is not necessarily a brilliant musician, but not necessarily a, a great thinker, I don't think. Uh, he, he was one of the uh, uh, vaccine deniers a couple of years ago, bless him. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, it, we become we became saturated. I, you know, I was a true believer. I left because I thought Hubbard was gone. I didn't leave because I thought Scientology was wrong. And then I, I was one of the instigators of the independent movement in 1983-84, um, right at the heart of the the UK independence, and involved with everybody, and and had some things to to do to stop the war that was about to start that um, David Mayo's followers were about to launch against Bent Corridon and other squirrels, as um, Mayo's representative at the time described them to me. And I got involved in that and said, you know, we can hang separately or we can hang together, as Benjamin Franklin assured us. And so I, I had a lot to do with that. But then within a, a matter of a few months, found I, did, I, I couldn't believe this anymore. But I was so lucky because you know, I had nine years. I went up to OT5. I was a class two and Dianetic and Method One auditor. I did the data series evaluators course. And I believed it. You know, I absolutely believed it. And then there's a little chink. There's a little point where you say, oh, no. And for me, it was um, a, a huge pile of documents that, that came from Michael Flynn's office. And um, a wonderful man called John Hansen, a New Zealander. And he said, uh, well, I've been over and seen Mike Flynn in Boston. And he gave me all these documents. I'm never going to read these. Do you want them? <laughs> and I just sat there and read through this 18-inch stack of documents. And they'd, they were collected by a guy called Michael Lynn Shannon, who has really not been acknowledged enough. I, I do acknowledge him in um, that sell these people a piece of blue sky. Uh, many people, including Omar Garrison, who was the official biographer of Ron Hubbard, Omar Garrison would not believe me when I said that I had not interviewed Jerry Armstrong and I did not get documents for the book from Jerry Armstrong. It was this guy, Michael Lynn Shannon, who was a journalist who'd gone around and got the school records and the university records and the newspaper clippings and put them together. And I read these things and I went, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. Owen Hubbard is a liar and he said honesty is sanity mm -hmm. so therefore he's insane by his own prescription mm -hmm. he also said the road to truth must be trod with true steps and then of course i started to find some of the many many conflicts in his own accounts of his uh, past I, I put together 22 approved hubbard biographies no two of them tell the same story mm -hmm. he was two four or six years old when he became a blood brother of the Blackfoot Indians. The Blackfoot Indians never had blood brothers. Their own historian has said that. In fact, as far as I know, no American native people had blood brothers. It's a Viking thing. But Tom Mix did it in Hollywood in the 1930s or 20s, and it became a thing. So Hubbard picked it up and did it. In his book, uh, his first novel, Buckskin Brigades, uh, in 34, I think it was, Hubbard says that he'd actually met somebody who knew the Blackfoot. And that's where the story starts. Uh, his aunt, Margaret Roberts, uh, who he, from the age of six months to 12 years, he lived in the same house with her. And she said, I, no, we, we didn't know anything about the Blackfoot Indians. You know? So it, you, I honed in on one story after another to find that he, he was a fabulous, he was a storyteller. Storyteller. Hubbard was a storyteller. And he was a very ill man. He was a man who suffered from a multitude of physical problems, uh, short-sightedness, asthma, bursitis in his right shoulder, and tried to cure them and failed to cure them. They persisted to the end of his life, but somehow managed to con us into believing that, that he had you know, cured war wounds. He didn't have any war wounds. <laughs> uh, that he'd studied with gurus in India, Tibet, Mongolia, and China. He hadn't been to India, Tibet, or Mongolia, let alone studied with anyone. And in China, because 
Scientology foolishly put his teenage diaries, his handwritten diaries, into court. And I think I still, I may have the only copies of them. It just happened that way. I got all of the documents from the court. And uh, the handwritten diaries, Helron Hubbard, two holidays in China. And the only mention of studying with a guru is him going to a, a Lama Seri, um, a Buddhist monastery, and saying that the monks sounded like bullfrogs. Mm. That's it. That's mm. the entire study with gurus. Then, of course, the nuclear physics thing. You know, I'm a nuclear physicist. And in a lecture, 23rd September 1950, Introduction to Dianetics, Hubbard says, I failed the course in atomic and molecular physics. And we have his grade sheet, which says exactly that. He never studied nuclear physics. He studied atomic and molecular, and he got an F grade. And he combined the science and what he'd learned from the gurus. And he was a student of Commander Thompson, who'd studied with Freud. Thompson never even met Freud, let alone studied him. So we did a lot of work, you know, over the years, various of us, to, to dig into this material and found that the man was, yeah, a storyteller, a fabulist, mm. um, who lived a, a vengeful, horrible life and persuaded people that he was a messiah, a savior, a Buddha, the Meteo Maitreya, the future Buddha, the man who would save the world. But he wasn't Maitreya, and the proof of that is he's dead. The myth of Maitreya, which is in the book of the Great Decease, which, yes, I've read, um, which is about the death of the Buddha, mm -hmm. says that this Maitreya or Maitreya, whether you prefer the Pali or the Sanskrit, the name is different in the two, Maitreya in Sanskrit, Maitreya in, in Pali, what is prophesied is that he will lead everyone into Nirvana. And he didn't. He's dead. So, yeah. you know, the hymn of Asia and all of that nonsense. And around and around we go. But there is something about Scientology that separates it from any other creed. I have studied literally hundreds of groups. Um, I've been doing it since I was a kid because when I stopped believing in the Christian notion of God, I started getting interested in all the heresies. So before I got into Scientology, I, was, I studied Zen Buddhism in a, in, in a, a temple. Um, I was interested in Taoism. I subsequently translated Lao Tzu's um, Tao Te Ching. Um, I'm very interested in this stuff. There is nothing like Scientology. It's unique. This man wrote more than any other human being has ever written. Now, a lot of that's cheating because it's transcriptions of, of lectures, but the Guinness Book of World Records tells us that he was the most prolific author of all time. Mm -hmm. So it's one man, two dictionaries, 600 pages each, new words, propaganda by redefinition of words, as he put it, that he devised this whole thing. When I used to, to visit LA and the Cult Awareness Network, still existed, hadn't been destroyed through infiltration and litigation. I, several times, was people would say to me, you know, we, we list 2,000 different cult groups. The only one we don't understand is Scientology. And I've been told that all around the world. Scientology is not like the rest. Transcendental meditation has two techniques. Scientology has 2,000, you know. He may have written all this books and all these words, but this is the most important thing which has to be flushed out in every show we do together. With all the rah-rah of Scientology, it comes down to wanting tens of thousands of dollars from you to exercise your demons, to exercise out of you, jettison and flush out of you the 400 million attached spirits which joined you after a volcanic explosion. We have to pump that up. In fact, when we do, a very limited amount of OSA are allowed to watch our show to, to do anything because many of them haven't even come anywhere near Nuts level. Some of them are not even clear in the internet unit. And as soon as the video, the, level the of worst, clear. That's, yeah, the, that. the worst thing in any show exposing what they hate the most is exposing their VT cluster, their attached spirits. 
So Scientologists he, actually he believe this, as Dad Cox said. He did all these words. And da, 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 da. Scientology is an exorcism religion. Shave it right down to modern basics. After OT3 to OT8, all it is, level after level, you sit there and have conversations with your attached spirits. You actually talk to them. And supposedly they talk back and there's all this telepathic this and that. And, <laughs> and then you kick them out of your universe. And sometimes they supposedly stick on a wall and you have to push them through the wall. And da, 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 da. there's all this mumbo jumbo. But let's get down to how they extract that. How, how do they have $3 billion? These people just pay and pay and pay and pay to sit at home and exercise their body titans, which are attached spirits. So no matter what fluff and froth and battlefield earth and mission earth, that's fluff and froth. The bottom line is your money is extracted to flush out your attached. That is Scientology. Mm. That is the essence of Scientology. And you ask them. OT3 to OT8, yeah. you are, no matter what else Hubbard said, no matter what other sci-fi he wrote, he wants you to sit down, talk to your attached spirits and expel them. Mm. Or just, and there's, uh, I'm going to send Spike, there's this little paragraph he wrote in a Knox issue. Have you considered the sociological impact that you are having by auditing knots? You are turning free beings loose in torrents. This is bound to have an effect on society, especially when these start picking up bodies and turn up to join the team at their local org. You are not just auditing one PC at this level. You are churning out cleared beings in volume, and we will start seeing the results sooner or later on society in general. Maybe you have thought about this too. It's nice to recognize the good effects you are creating. Another thing that Hubbard claims is when you expel these things, you're making them go clear because they realize they're mocking it up and they're attached to you. So Hubbard claims that solo knots auditors are putting into the world day by day tens of thousands of cleared beings. Doesn't seem to have worked very well. I mean, it came out right. of 83 in 1967 and 68, and, and there should be lots of these cleared beings picking up bodies by now. I mean, millions of them, and they, they yeah. should. Well, look, 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 at, look at the state of Earth. Look at the war. Yeah. On, yeah. On Pu look at Putin on the verge of threatening nuclear and all of this. He is threatening where, nuclear. Where is the... Huh? He is Putin is actually threatening nuclear war. He's not even on the verge of it. He's said it a couple of times. I'll yeah. do this. Um, yes. Would that Ukraine hadn't given up their nuclear weapons. <laughs> but never mind. Um, Earth is certainly not more peaceful. And all these so-called cleared BTs are now all there to take up new bodies. And Anyway, so... Hmm. Let, let me... You, you asked a question in the middle of that, which was a rhetorical question, but I'm going to answer it as best I can. And that is, how do people believe this? How do people come to believe this? When I left Scientology, um, I, you know, I'd done OT3 and Xena and the body thetans and all of that stuff and the volcanoes, oh, great. And anyone that hasn't, it's in, um, come out of the closet, the South Park episode. <laughs> Scientologists actually believe this and they do. Um, though Julia Lewis and many other celebrities, when asked if they believed it, said that it was nonsense and it wasn't part of Scientology because they were lying. But I was very interested in this thing about body thetans. And I remembered that when I was in the Zen temple, they had a Tibetan tanker on the wall, a tanker is a painting. And it was a painting of somebody meditating and expelling demons. And I thought, oh, well, maybe he, maybe he encountered. Tibetan teaching. So I went off and read five books about Tibet. And I finally hit um, Terry Clifford's um, Tibetan Buddhist 
uh, Medicine and Psychiatry, which was actually a doctoral thesis that became a book. And uh, there was an answer. And uh, she interviewed, she, she was interviewing the Dalai Lama's personal physician. And uh, I'm not a fan of Tibetan Buddhism, by the way, let me just underline that, I'm not a fan of, of many things anymore. Um, some terrible things have happened in there as well. Um, you know, for example, uh, the Dalai Lama taking $2 million from Keith Raniere of Nexium. That, that was, really? yes, really? yes. Oh my goodness. I mean, he was also seen with um, Osahara, the head of Om Shinrikyo. There's a famous picture of them, oh. you know, with each other. He, he needs money because he's got to support a whole community of people. I understand that, but yeah. it's a bit like Karen Bass. <laughs> You've got to be a bit careful in your research. But <laughs> putting that aside, the Dalai Lama's physician, who'd be one of the most highly educated people in Tibetan Buddhism, explained that they talk about gadons and the various different types of spirits when they're dealing with peasants. When you're dealing with people who are uneducated, you say you've got spirits attached to you. When you're dealing with educated people, you say there are thought forms that are influencing you. And when you deal with Buddhists, enlightened Buddhists, you say everything is illusion. Yeah. Those three levels of perception interested me greatly. I then, of course, realized demons in Christianity, dibuks in the Jewish uh, faith, uh, the uh, genies uh, in uh, Islam. The, the discarnate spirit is a big thing, but there is, there is something else underneath this that needs to be said, and I don't believe has been said. I spent a lot of time on this, and that is, in 1949, Ron Hubbard, in January, was staying um, in Savannah, Georgia. He was a guest of Arthur J. Burks, a fellow pulp writer, who actually published, I think, more stories than Hubbard. I think he published about 800 stories in all. Burks seems to have been a perfectly nice man. He was a major in the Marines, and he was, he wrote a, an autobiography called Monitors, which is quite a rare book, but Yes, I've read it. And he talks about the visit of the redhead, mm. which is Hubbard. It's undoubtedly Hubbard because in January 49, Tony Ortega found a letter, which to my shame, I've had for a long time. I've got a huge collection of material, which you know, people don't really ask me about very much. And if, if I'd realized the interest there'd be in, and there are other things that still haven't been published, but, there's a letter from January 49, where Hubbard writes to Forry Ackerman, who was his literary agent from, I think, 38 onwards. Um, and Forry provided me with all of the correspondence along the way. Um, and Tony has an interview with Forry Ackerman, which I supplied, which we got making it uh, the uh, secret, I think it's the secret world of Elrond Hubbard, secret life, secret life of Elrond Hubbard, which is a very good documentary that I worked on back in 96. And the connection in 49, Hubbard writes the first, makes the first known reference to what would become Dianetics a year later. And he writes to his literary agent and says he found something that's got more money making angles than anything else, and that you can rape women without them knowing using this technique. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the original Dianetic te technique, which was also called deep trance hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Never worked with the reverie technique that was invented to write the book. Um, whole other set of stories in there, but it's from Savannah, Georgia, the Slatter. He's staying with Burks, and Burks in Monitors says Burks had his own interesting view of, of the world, and he says he believed in the little its. That's what he calls them in the book, the little its, and they're these tiny little beings. And he says the thing about the redhead was that he could actually see them. He could get them to jump between his fingers. This is the origin of body thetans. But there's yeah. something severely more sinister going on yeah. here. When you study the work of Alistair Crowley, who Hubbard called his very dear friend, and of course he practiced the Babylon working, which is still much talked about by, by magicians, in 1946, 
with Jack Parsons. The, the popular Disney idea of magic is that you make spells and incantations, but magicians actually seek to recruit discarnate spirits, disembodied spirits, add a spell to them and then send them against their enemies. So <laughs> magicians seek to collect as many of these spirits as possible so that they can send them en masse against their enemies. Now, I know this is ludicrous, but this is the philosophy that Hubbard believed in. Mm. Alistair Crowley was his guru, though Crowley called him a, a lout and an idiot. He thought that Crowley was the great man. Mm. And so he believed, I mean, Aaron Hubbard Jr. Nibs said that his father read Crowley's Book of the Law when he was 16 and was devoted to his work for the rest of his life. And I think that is true. So what you're doing is amassing spirits. Hubbard certainly believed in body thetans. When Virginia Downsborough rescued him from Gran Canaria in December 66, when he was working on OT3 for the first time, she said he was completely demented. I interviewed her twice. And she was still giving OT3 to people at the time. In the first interview I gave with her, she told my friend, about the same guy that got angry with me, angry Larry, she told him to shh because she had people studying OT3 in the course room. And yet she said he was completely out of his mind, obsessed that the body thetans had taken him over. He'd stopped eating. Mm. He, all he was, he was living off a shelf full of drugs. That's what she mm. said. Sadly, she was, even in two interviews, she wouldn't tell me what the drugs were. We have pretty much worked it out, I think. But he believed in the body thetans. At the end of his life, when he asked Sarge Fouth to kill him with a, an e-meter that would, he believed, he believed that the body thetans had taken over. Now let's add a little thought to this, which maybe nobody else has had. Where, who is the hero of all Scientologists? Ron Hubbard. So all of your body thetans that are sat there, you know, listening in on this, if you had such things that I don't believe we do, for them, Elrond Hubbard will be their hero too. So where will they go when you set them free? Was Elrond Hubbard, was there this other bizarre subtext, accepting this man was insane, was this other text that he was seeking to collect body thetans and that that was some really weird other purpose? I, I put this into the debate. I, I don't believe it but it's a possibility that has not been voiced, that he was actually, in his attempt to create a magic that would make him the emperor of the world, which was, I think, pretty much definitely what he wished to be. He wanted to be in charge of everything. He was gathering, seeking to gather these things. They don't exist. <laughs> so it, you know, it all went to a crazy place, but... I, we, we were going to talk about recovery today, and we don't have time. I right. think we've talked about some really interesting things. Yes, and indeed. Indeed. it's worth saying that, that I have a key to recovery. People would come to me and, and they'd think, oh, no, I'm going to need thousands of hours of auditing now to undo it all. No, it takes one moment. And this is what you do. You dare to question something that Ron Hubbard said. Now, the example I, I give of this is, is from a friend of mine, and she was two when her parents got into Scientology. She was horrifically abused by her stepfather. Uh, Scientology stopped her when she reported it to the police at the age of 11. She escaped, so she was sent back to be further abused by this man. At 16, to escape that, she joined the Sea Organization. She had five years in the Sea Organization. She then went and did a degree when she left. And 16, 17 years later, 16 years later, she talked to me. And um, she said in our first conversation, because she'd never known anything but Scientology, she was brought up in it. So she said, is it true that reality is an agreement, as Ron Hubbard says? And I said, if you're the hypnotist, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, no, it's out there. Whether you want it to be out there or you think it's out there or not, it's out there, reality. 
it's not because you are, as Hubbard says, chanting space particle position, space particle position every second. I've never chanted that in my life other than to exemplify this point. What was fascinating was that she'd not been able to question the authority. And it's, it's the same in other groups. Any fanatical group, you're not allowed to ask questions. Yeah. And she asked that question the next time we spoke. She said that she'd used scented laundry conditioner. And we both knew what she was talking about. She had gone for a lifetime never having perfumed soap, shampoo, or anything because of the hygiene hat of the sea organization. Because Elrond Hubbard believed that psychiatrists are ruling the world with rose perfume. What a lunatic that man was. And he was scent phobic. As of course was Rajneesh, which is quite interesting, you know, that maybe this is something that comes with temporal lobe epilepsy, that the heightened sense of smell, he couldn't have, you know, his paint had to, if you painted the walls, there had to be no smell. And they had to have visqueen linings in, in his dwellings to make sure smells couldn't get in. He was a little bit on the crazy side. But what had happened was that she had dared to question something that Hubbard had said. So as he says, you know, you to find a stable datum, find one small thing where Hubbard said something that's wrong and accept that he was wrong. Mm. So, for example, in we, last time we talked in, in the false data stripping policy, where he says that the syllogism was devised by Socrates. It wasn't. It was devised by Aristotle, as he says in the Phoenix lectures. So just find that one little thing that says this man could make mistakes and then keep moving, keep challenging things, and gradually it will unweave. There are ways of speeding the process up and we'll perhaps talk about that. Hopefully we will talk about the next, the next time we, we get together. Yes, yes. Thank you, John. You, Thank you said some important things. The, what I love about YouTube, it just goes on and it has its own perpetuity. There's no time limit. Doesn't, there is no parameter or division of time. It doesn't mm. say, we'll have you up for six months and then we delete it. It just is forever. So thank you for your pearls of wisdom, John. I want to send you a big hug thank and you. we'll be back. Thank yes, we, we will. We come back. Yeah, we come back. Thank you to all of those who listened all the way. Yeah, getting this far and, and stick a few bucks in the Patreon account, would you? Yes. Spike is now beginning to have one meal a week, you know, so we, we're nearly getting, keeping her alive. Please, please do. Yeah. And John, I will see you again. Take yeah. care. On the other bye side. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.